Shalom and welcome to Biblical Faith with Sam Peek. We invite you to join us as Sam brings a study in the Torah from the Jewish sages. And now our speaker, Sam Peek. Ah, uh, let's see, where, ha where are we at? Does anybody actually know? I have page 124, is that correct? Sort of? Okay, well actually what we, when we finished the last time we were talking about the idea of repenting. We're in Pirkei Avot, in chapter 2 of Pirkei Avot, Mishnah number 15, where uh, Rabbi Eliezer says, you know, the last part of that, of that Mishnah, he says, repent one day before your death. And the last time we were together we looked at that and what that means, of course, what it means is you have no idea what the day you're going to die. So that means you have to be in a constant, a continual state, literally, of repentance to be able to repent one day before your death because you have no idea when you'll die. And that's the basic shot, simple level of that. And we also looked, I think, at uh, Rabbi Arusha's book, New Book in Forest Fields, on the concept of what it means to repent. We did. Yeah, I, I believe that's correct. It's been a while since we've been together. But, uh, but let's pick back up. Let's move to page 124 in Rabbi Tuvia Basser's book of the Maharal of Prague on Pirkei Avot, all right? And we're still, he's finishing that, that Mishnah number 14, or Mishnah number 15, the first part of it, where he, where he says that three-pronged advice, it rounds a person in all three human dimensions. In other words, the Maharal is seeing this, that all of these rabbis, and by the way, all of these rabbis were still in this whole deal where Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai and his students, his five students, okay, uh, which they're all great rabbis on their own. Uh, but all, all of this advice, all, he's asking questions and they're giving all of this advice on what's the most important thing, what should you avoid, what should you pursue, and, and all of this. And, the, and, you know, it's absolutely amazing. We can take these, what we've been doing in here from the Maharal of Prague, from Rabbi Judah Lowe of Prague, is he's, he's shown us that not only is there just a simple level, you know, Pirkei Avot just on a simple level of what we can understand just off the words themselves is an unbelievable book of advice, of Musar, advice to us on how to live, on what's most important, what we should avoid, and really how to pattern our life. Don't ever lose sight of that, of the simple level of the advice, okay? But the Maharal has been taking us on a much deeper level, showing us that uh, these, these great rabbis are saying, you know, they are chazal. These are, these are the, the hakamim, uh, the wise ones. These are the sages. And that they're, what they're saying is just like, and this is why it's oral Torah. Because oral Torah is just like written Torah in the sense that it has all of these different levels of interpretation. It has all of this unbelievable depth to it. And he's been showing us, you know, that they've been... And this has not been exhaustive. I mean, we haven't exhausted. This is ju we've just only taken this study from the point of the Maharal of Prague on certain things, insight that he had into their words. But it's much even much more than that. Anyway, the Maharal ends that discussion saying this is three-pronged advice, okay? And what was that advice? He says, uh, Rabbi Eliezer says, let your fellow's honor be as dear to you as your own. Don't get angry easily okay, and repent one day before your death. And he says to us, he says, all of this is it, it rounds a person in all three human dimensions, the social dimension, the personal dimension, and the spiritual dimension. And it's very easy just to see the, the, the social dimension is talking about your friend's honor being as dear to you. The personal dimension, what's good, what's really good for you personally, spiritually, your soul, on your soul level, is don't get angry easily, okay? And then on the spiritual level, to be sure and repent one day before your death, which basically he says, constantly do a self-examination, constantly repent of that, constantly confess that to Hashem and ask His forgiveness. And we saw from Rabbi Arush why that's really so important and that it's actually not so hard to do, okay? All right. Now, Rabbi Eliezer picks up his second part and this is very interesting, and there's an extremely, extreme amount of good advice here that in the 21st century, people do not follow this advice. I promise you. Even Torah people do not follow this advice, which is worrisome. Mm -hmm. What does he say? Warm yourself by the fire of the sages. 
But beware of their glowing coal, lest you be burnt, because their bite is the bite of a fox, their sting is the sting of a scorpion, and their hiss is the hiss of a serpent. And then finally, C, three, all of their words are like fiery coals. Now, my personal take on that is, of course, it's very obvious, warm yourself by the fire of the sages, meaning come close to the sages and even living sages today. Come close to them. Learn from Torah teachers. Learn from great rabbis. All right? But don't treat them like you're their equal. Oh, heavens. <laughs> but people do. Oh, they do. Absolutely. Because they are like a glowing coal. And that can, you can get burnt in all of these different ways. Okay? And that's not even, that, the Maharal is going, we're going to look at what he says here. But he's going, to, he's going to follow this same line. But that's not even saying that you tick off the Torah sage. I mean, it, the Maharal is going to say that. But it's even saying that that can happen just from Hashem, just from the heavenly courts who see the way you treat a Torah sage. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Let's read what the Ramchal says. Or not the Ramchal, the Maharal. Excuse me. One of the things that comes to mind in meeting with Rabbi Richmond. Yes. There's people that will actually try to tell him Absolutely. what he's teaching. Yeah, this is very, very common when the Rabbi Richmond and I go and speak in places, especially with, and I hate to say it, with large Christian audiences, but even people who are not Christian anymore, even in the B'nai Noach community, they still haven't got that out of them where they they have the chutzpah to actually, <laughs> to actually think they're going to come and teach him something, you know, or, uh, or, the, or they have a prophecy that they need to give him, or they've had a dream that they need to tell him. I, I don't know, but I, that's one part of, well, that's one part of it that makes me a little crazy. Another part of it is, is how familiar people treat with him. Like, for instance, I'll give you a good example. All of the years, and I don't even mind that this is on the tape. It's a good thing it's on the tape. All of the years that uh, Rabbi Richman and I were together on television, the people, the owners, the, all the people who worked uh, at that television station, I have to say they had very little respect for him. They called him by his first name, like they were, they were his fishing buddy. Uh, you know, and with me, I mean, you know, when the rabbi stands up, I stand up. When he comes in the room, you stand up. When, I mean, uh, when he sits down, then you can sit down. Uh, you know, and you never ever would, would just blurt out and call him by his first name. Uh, but that was very, very common practice there, which always, it just irritated me because it was very, very obvious they had, they did not respect him for who he was as a Torah sage because they didn't have a clue. But they should have, and uh, so that was worrisome to me. This is part of what's in this, in this Mishnah, it, because I'm going to tell you, if you don't respect the sages, you also don't respect God. Wow. But can you feel close to them? You, oh, absolutely, you can feel close to them, but they're, yes, oh, no, I'm not trying to say don't be close to them. That's not what I'm trying to say. The, uh, Rabbi Eliezer is not trying to say that either. He says, warm yourself by the fire of the sages. You have to get close to get warm. Okay? But you also have to respect them. You also have to, he says, beware. I mean, don't, you know, you're not going to go sit on the coals, are you? That's a little too warm. Okay? Or you're not going to put one in your pocket and take it with you. Uh, you understand what I'm trying to say? You have to, so in order to get benefit from the fire, you have to respect and know how to treat the fire and know how close you can come and how close you can't come. Okay, that, that's what he's trying to say. No, and it's not. I don't want it to sound that way uh, that I'm trying to say that. Oh, let's, let's see what the Maharal says. It'll be interesting. He says, warm yourself by the fire of the sages. He said, this means cleave to the sages, of course. 
The image of warming oneself by the fire conveys the idea of receiving benefit by simply being close to the benefactor. By the way, you know, that is, you know, a person is a real Torah sage when you can be with them and not, not, neither one of you ever say one word and yet you feel good just by being in their presence. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Now, this is extremely true. They don't have to open their mouth. But he says, beware of their glowing coal lest you be burnt. And this is what he says. Be careful that closeness with the sages does not lead to a sense of familiar, being overly familiar with them, okay? That can result in offending them. The image of the glowing coal conveys the need for caution to avoid getting burnt when coming too close to the coal for warmth, okay? Okay. Then he gives, now he gives two different ideas, and both of them, one of them is one way, and then the other one is the exact opposite uh, uh, on these three metaphors. For their bite is the bite of a fox, their sting is the sting of a scorpion, their hiss is the hiss of a serpent. And he says these correspond to three different degrees of being burnt after you offend a sage. And once again, it may be that the sage <laughs> gets after you, okay? But it may be that you're judged for it in a heavenly court, or maybe even Hashem <laughs> gets after you. And he's using the sage. I mean, well, he may be using the sage. He may use something else entirely. Uh, okay? These three metaphors, he says, correspond to being burnt, three degrees. The most severe, he says, in this first opinion, is biting. The powerful intellect, he says, of a scholar does not act by bits and pieces. It acts with total, total, utter totality. I'll get that right in a minute. Therefore, if you arouse his hatred, I'm not sure I would actually use that word uh, because Torah sages, I'm not sure, would hate another person, okay? But they may very well hate their behavior is the thing, okay? But if it's aroused, he says, it may well be compared to the vicious bite of a fox who will bite completely through a limb. A lesser offense, he says, such as lack of due respect, may give rise to a level of resentment rather than hatred, and the image of a sting is less severe than a bite, although the sting of a scorpion is still quite dangerous. And finally, the scholar may feel only some level of anger, and this is portrayed by the hiss of a serpent, just as an angry person, he says, may whisper to himself. The hissing of an aroused ser serpent is very likely a precursor to biting, and likewise the anger of a scholar should be cause for concern that danger could be imminent. All right? Now he says there's another explanation for that, and that is based on how dangerous each of these creatures is, and it actually reverses the order of what we just looked at, where the bite of a fox is it's not poisonous. It's painful, but it's not poisonous. Uh, and it's the response to the least degree of offense. The scorpion sting is poisonous, which corresponds to a greater degree of offense. And the serpent's poison is the most deadly of all, and it can be drawn by a serious offense to the scholar's honor. All right? The main point I'm trying to make is we've already made it. Okay? All right. All their words are like fiery coals, he says. This is a reference to the fact that one who violates, this is quite interesting what he says, one who violates the enactments, in other words, rabbinical law, okay, of the rabbis is actually deserving of death. Now, he puts a note there, and this is found actually in the Talmud, in Berachot uh, 4b. The death penalty for violating a rabbinical enactment is administered at the hands of heaven, in other words, by a heavenly court, not by an earthly court. All right? So if you break uh, a rabbinical decree, you're liable to the death penalty by the heavenly court, but you're not going to be put on trial by any bait deem or the Sanhedrin or anything like that and executed here, all right? The Talmud, he says, uh, adjures us to be even more careful with rabbinical act enactments than we are with Torah laws. And we'll, we'll see why that is in a little bit. Whether the Torah requires us to do a mitzvah or to refrain from a sin, very few laws of the Torah carry the death penalty. But by contrast, every transgression of rabbinical law 
is liable to death at the hands of heaven. All right? Now, look what it's Rashi. He has a Rashi down here uh, explanation. It's in footnote number three. Rashi tells us, as it says, and he quotes from Kohelet chapter 10 and verse 8, Ecclesiastes 10, 8, which says, He who breaks down a wall will be bitten by a snake. The meaning, according to Rashi, is that deadly forces are unleashed by breaking through a safeguard. A wall is something to keep you, in this case, from something that could be very dangerous. Okay? And that's what all of the rabbinical enactments actually are. They are a hedge. They're a wall to keep you from treading on the commandment and, and actually breaking a commandment. Okay? So we're back to Halakha? Oh, of course. This is absolutely back to Halakha. Okay? So this is what it's meaning, according to Rashi, where it says in Ecclesiastes, he who breaks down a wall will be bit by a snake. Deadly forces are unleashed by breaking through a safeguard. The wall is there to protect you. The enactments of the rabbis are generally a safeguard to the laws of the Torah. And death is an inherent consequence of breaking the fence that's around the Torah. Okay? Uh, because it's just in every place that the rabbis do that. You know, I hear criticism about them all the time. Well, that's a fence that they, they built there. But the fence is there for a reason. The fence is to keep you from dabbling with whether or not you're actually keeping the commandment or breaking the commandment, okay? Because they know that most of us don't literally have the sense to know <laughs> in certain situations whether we're actually keeping the commandment or breaking the commandment. So they put a fence back here. Okay? Okay. Mishnah number 16, chapter 2 of Pirkei Avod in Mishnah 16. Rabbi Yehoshua says, An evil eye, the evil inclination and hatred of other people, remove a person from the world. This will be interesting. Now, back, back, let's, let's, let me jump back real quick so we can catch the context of what they have been asked. Okay. Rabban, this was the instructions from Rabban Yochanan ben Zakkai. All right, go out and discern what is the evil path that a that a human being should distance himself. All right, and this is all all of their answers. So now we're to Rabbi Yehoshua, and this is what he says: You should distance yourself. You should not have an evil eye. You should distance yourself from the evil inclination and hatred of other people. Remove a person from the world. This will be interesting. Uh, so the question is, the question the Maharal asks is, why is it that these three things remove a person from the world? And he begins his answer. It is the goodness of things that justifies their ongoing existence. Listen to his logic. It's extremely interesting. He says, that is actually the meaning of the declaration in the book of Genesis in Breshit, where it says, and God saw that it was good. Okay? In other words, that is what sealed each step of the creation. By the same token, the first tablets of the Ten Commandments did not contain the word good. You know why, according to the Mahara? Because they would ultimately be broken. In other words, smashed. And that is, he, he explains this in his, uh, his Sefer Teferit Yisrael, he says near the end of chapter 43, that's the Maharal's personal explanation of why in all the Ten Commandments the word good is not mentioned because they would be broken. All right? Okay. Conversely, evil is that which brings about extinction. And that which is evil must come to an end. Eventually it must come to an end. So the things that are mentioned in this Mishnah remove a person from the world meaning from this life. In other words, these, this is what kills you. That's what Rabbi Yehoshua is trying to say. If you want to die soon, <laughs> then have an evil eye, give in to your evil inclination, and hate other people. That's what he's saying. Because those things are evil, they're the three things, he says, the things that are mentioned in this Mishnah remove a person from the world because they are the exact three things that the Scripture, that the Torah, the Tanakh, 
actually describes as evil. And then the Maharal shows us where are these three things. An evil eye. Ayin hara. Uh, one who begrudges others good fortune. That's what an evil eye. And we've talked about this before. Stingy person. To the extent that I'm so stingy that if you have good fortune, I begrudge you that. I should have it, not you. Very stingy. Most people wouldn't consider that a stingy thing. Though. Oh, no, that is stingy. That's the that ultimate sting. sting. Yeah. That's, ultimate That's the ultimate sting. That, you know, we think of stingy as somebody who just guards all their yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. But no, they, they're resentful that you have stuff also and that they don't have your stuff. That's the real sting. Wow. That's what a real evil eye is. Okay? And what does it say? One who begrudges another's good fortune. Uh, and, it, and in Proverbs, Mishle 23, 6, it says, do not eat the bread of him who has an evil eye. Okay? The evil inclination, the Yetzer Hara, as it says, and again he quotes now from Genesis, Bereshit 8.21, for the desire of man's heart is evil from his youth, meaning he's under the control of the evil inclination from his youth, from puberty on. An evil heart, Lev Hara, as it says, and now he quotes from Jeremiah, Yirmiyahu, uh, 317, where it says, Nor shall they walk any more after the stubbornness of their evil heart. Do you see what the, the Maharal did? He actually went to the Tanakh, and in the Tanakh he found that the three things that are mentioned specifically as being evil are these three things that Rabbi Yehoshua pointed out here. An evil eye, evil inclination, and hatred of other people. Okay, which is an evil heart. Now, this, he, he asked a very good question. These three categories of evil are the very things of which Rabbi Yehoshua warns. He says, now, why, why does he say hatred of other people instead of saying an evil heart? All right, Because an evil heart includes hatred for people because hatred is in the heart. And this is coming from the Torah in Vayikra 1917, Leviticus 1917, where it says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. All right? He's, he's doing some Torah exegesis here that's really, really nice, what he's putting together. I'll tell you that just in case we're not following it. It's very nice what he's done here on this page. Okay? He did not use the scriptural term, he says, because most inst instances of an evil heart like withholding charity, and in other words, if you know you should give, but you don't. Actually, that's just a manifestation of an evil eye. But anyway, such as withholding charity are not as serious as the other evils. It's hatred for people that is so patently evil that will remove you from this world. All right? This Mishnah, he says, follows thematically along the same themes from the previous Mishnah. Rabbi Eliezer's Musar before prevents us from forfeiting life in the world to come. All right? In other words, from messing ourselves up in the, in the world to come. But Rabbi Yehoshua's advice, it's all having to do uh, with life in this world. And he says, and it prevents prematurely losing the life of this world, which also is very interesting. Okay. Now... We come to Mishnah number 17. We'll just introduce it, and uh, then we'll have to stop, and then we'll restart, okay? Now we come to Rabbi Yosei. Rabbi Yosei says, let your fellow's money, before it was their honor, now it's money. Let your fellow's money be as dear to you as your own. Apply yourself to study the Torah. In other words, work at it. Why? Because it's not yours by inheritance. You just don't inherit it. God doesn't pour it in your head. And C, or, or number three, let all of your deeds be for the sake of heaven. The Maharal begins and he says, people live within the three dimensions. We've talked about it already. Of Number one, a social dimension. Number two, a personal dimension. And three, spiritual relationship. And this Mishnah, he says, provides guidance in all three areas. All right? Number one, the social. Let your fellow's money be as dear to you as your own. This strengthens one's social relationships. Concern for another's money 
develops a person's relationship with other people, all right? In other words, like uh, many of y'all ask me from time to time, is everything okay? You don't just mean, am I still breathing air, okay? Uh, that's not exactly what you mean. You're, you're meaning that on, on a number of different levels. And one of those levels happens to be, are you, do you have enough money? Are you okay? Are you starving to death? I mean, you know, and if so, you need to tell somebody. Uh, and that's, that's the idea here. Uh, then, applying yourself to the study of Torah, this advice perfects one's very being through the Torah. He says we've already explained that earlier because it is the Torah above all that elevates a person from being just a physical creature to being a spiritual, intellectual being, to really coming into what a human being is supposed to be. The Torah is everything. Uh, it's absolutely everything. And those of us who have been on this path for a while know that. For it is not yours by inheritance, he says. The reason that Torah study requires application, he says, is precisely because it doesn't flow automatically from generation to generation like an inheritance does. It's not, I can't say, you know, I leave in my will all my Torah knowledge to my kids. Yeah. <laughs> no, they have to acquire it theirself. Right. It doesn't come that way. And let all of your deeds be for the sake of heaven. This is so important. This is so important. This is, you know what, this is, this is a way of stating, let everything that you think, say, and do be either in order for the, for, for the benefit of other people or in order to please Hashem. That's what this statement means. He says, this addresses the spiritual relationship. A person can, it can be done, they can perfect their relationship with God to the point where everything that they do, I wouldn't say religious intention, I wouldn't, because religious is sometimes taken in a derogatory way, but with what we just said, this is exactly what they mean. When they say, let all your deeds be for the sake of heaven, what does that mean? It means you're doing it for the sake of Hashem, you're doing it in order to please Him. That's what it really means, okay? At least in my humble opinion. The next time we're together, we'll come to chapter 2 and verse, uh, or Mishnah number 18, and it will be interesting also. All right, we'll stop right now, and I'll tell you Shalom Uvrakah, peace and a blessing. Thank you for joining us in our study. If you enjoyed this study and are interested in learning more from the Torah and the sages of Israel, then check us out on the internet at www.bfm.com. 101.com or you may contact us toll free at 1-800-639-0169 our mailing address is biblical faith p.o box 2 abilene texas 79604 until next time we wish you shalom uvaka peace and a blessing